Good morning and welcome once again to our time together today in God's Word. My name is Tom Robbins. I'm pastor here at Faith Baptist Church of Camp Point, Illinois. I'm so glad that you could join me today. Today we are back to the book of Genesis, looking together today at Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. And the title of today's message is Faithfulness and Joy. Do you believe someone when they make a promise to you? It kind of depends on who makes the promise, doesn't it? If it's a friend or a parent or a teacher, you probably would trust them and believe them at least. If it was a politician, you might not believe them. Actually, any time a human being makes a promise, there's probably a measure of doubt. However, there's one who makes a lot of promises and keeps every one of them. And that person is God. That's what our portion of scripture today reminds us of here in Genesis chapter 21. It reminds us that God kept his promise to Abraham. God kept his promise because he is faithful. And God's faithfulness in keeping his promise brought joy to Abraham and to Sarah. That's why the title of the message today is Faithfulness and Joy. This morning we're only going to look at these first seven verses of Genesis chapter 21. And we'll do so in three parts. God, Abraham, and Sarah. And we begin with... God's faithfulness in the first two verses. Listen to what it says. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time set, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. Does anything stand out to you in those two verses that I just read? There's three references to God's faithfulness there. Notice verse 1, it says that the Lord visited Sarah, but then it says, as he had said. Back in chapter 18, verse 10, God said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. So now he visits just as he said. The second part of verse 1 says that the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. What had he spoken? Well, if you go back to chapter 17, it says, God said, I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Chapter 18, verse 14, he said, at the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life and Sarah shall have a son. So the Lord did now for Sarah as he had spoken. And then in verse 2, it says, Abraham, excuse me, Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. Again, back to chapter 17, verse 21. I, God said, on my covenant I will establish with Isaac, the son who is to be born, whom a Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Chapter 18, I will return to you according to the time of life. Verse 14, at the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life. So now it says, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. All of this reminds us of God's faithfulness. What God promises, God does. That's why in uh, Romans chapter 4, when Paul was writing about Abraham and the promises of God, it says, uh, about Abraham that he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief but was strengthened in faith giving glory to God being fully convinced that what he God had promised he was also able to perform what God promises he does now this promise that is being fulfilled in Genesis chapter 21 uh, the promise actually was made some 25 years before this Clear back in Genesis chapter 12 when God came to Abraham and, and called him and made his promise. But we must remember that in God's eyes, on God's timetable, he is never late. 
God doesn't operate on the same timetable we do. In fact, 2 Peter 3 verse 8 reminds us that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. That's why we're instructed throughout God's word like in Isaiah and Psalms to wait upon the Lord. But here we see now the culmination of all of this time, the promise of God being fulfilled. God's faithfulness is on display. What a day that must have been when Isaac was born. Can you imagine the child of promise? The child was born and the words came out, it's a boy. Can you imagine the joy that Abraham must have experienced at this time? John Phillips, in his commentary on the book of Genesis, wrote these words. He said, we are reminded of old Ebenezer Scrooge when he woke up woke up after his three soul-shaking hauntings to find out it was still Christmas Day. He was so transported with joy he could hardly put his clothes on. I don't know what to do, cried Scrooge, laughing and crying at the same time. I am as light as a feather. I am as happy as an angel. I am as merry as a schoolboy. I am as giddy as a drunken man. He cavorted about his rooms. He burst into a laugh. Really, exclaims Dickens, Really, for a man who had been out of practice for so many years, it was a splendid laugh, a most illustrious laugh, the father of a long line of laughs. The author continues and says, So it must have been with staid old Abraham. A boy had been born into his home, his boy, Sarah's boy, God's boy. And had it been possible for us to be there that day, we might have seen him popping in and out of his tent, laughing and chuckling and beaming and embracing everyone within reach. God's faithfulness to Abraham and Sarah brought joy. It brought joy to both Abraham and Sarah. And in the midst of Abraham's joy, we see our next point as we look at Abraham and we see Abraham's joyful obedience. You see, his, his joy doesn't overshadow his need to obey what God had said. Remember, Isaac is the child of promise. He is the child that through which the promises God made to Abraham will be fulfilled. Ultimately, the promise that God made of a seed clear back in Genesis 3 would be fulfilled ultimately through uh, Isaac. So his joy prompted him, I'm sure, to be obedient. And there are two specifics of, of, of his obedience here in, in Genesis 21. First of all, we're told in verse 3 that he named the boy Isaac. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Now, why is that significant? Well, back in chapter 17 and verse 19, God said, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. Now, you may have heard this before, but the name Isaac has to do with laughter. It means he laughs. And certainly, uh, this name that God assigned to Isaac was a name that would be a reminder of the disobedience of, of Sarah and how she had laugh or excuse me the disbelief of Sarah how she had laughed in unbelief back in chapter 17 but it's also a statement of joy because now the the laughter that was unbelief before becomes a laughter of joy I mean verse 5 tells us that Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him think of that uh, this was something that was uh, Unplanned, or well, it was planned by God, but it was t totally unbelievable in the realm of mankind. And so the name Isaac, assigned by God, Abraham obeys, he names him Isaac, and it's a statement of, of joy. But the other act of obedience we see here in verse 4 is that he circumcised Isaac when he was eight, eight days old. Notice uh, verse 4. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Go back again to chapter 17, verses 12 and 13, where God said to Abraham, He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. 
Every male child of your generations, he who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant, he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. God had commanded Abraham that the males should be circumcised. It was a physical sign of God's covenant promise with them. It was a reminder to them that they had been chosen as God's people. And Abraham shows his faith in the covenant promise of God here. He shows his faith in the promise that they were God's people. Remember what we read again in in Romans chapter 4 where Paul said, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham believed the promise of God and ultimately that promise goes all the way back to Genesis 3 where where God said after the fall uh, that there would be the seed of the woman who would crush the head of Satan even though he would be his heel would be bruised pointing ahead to the coming redeemer the coming messiah the coming savior Jesus Christ Abraham did not have history like we do to look back on but he believed the promise of God and now he is seeing that promise being fulfilled in his, before his own eyes and so he responds in obedience by circumcising Isaac and by naming him Isaac. God was faithful. God is faithful. Abraham was joyfully obedient. But he wasn't the only one that was joyful. We're told here also that Sarah was joyful. And so thirdly today, we see Sarah's joyful worship in verses 6 and 7. Notice what it says. Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And she was not young either. God has made me laugh. This is a different laughter now. Back in chapter 18, when God announced that she would have a son in a year's time, Uh, She wasn't right there in front of him, but she was in the tent, but it says that she laughed. And her laugh then was a laugh of unbelief. But now her laugh is a laugh of joy, pure joy at the fulfillment of God's promise. You see, Isaac's name takes on new significance here. Her words in the original language, my understanding is, have kind of the cadence of a song. There are three thoughts here. You heard them as I read that. First of all, the first thought was that God has changed my laughter from unbelief to joyful praise. She said, God has made me laugh. She's acknowledging the fact that all of this comes from God. That's a statement of worship. But then she also says, all who hear will laugh with me. You see, true joy is infectious. And this is really a a word of testimony. Uh, Can you imagine those who uh, heard the laughter and heard about the birth of this son would want to know how in the world could this happen? What is happening? And it was an opportunity to, to share a testimony of the wonderful power and mercy and grace and faithfulness of God. Also, this was an opportunity to worship. And then it says in verse 7, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? In other words, this was something that was beyond human understanding. It was a miracle. And so it was an opportunity again to to praise the greatness of God. The only explanation for this was God. This was a joyful statement of praise, a joyful statement of worship on Sarah's part. So here we see God's faithfulness as he kept his promises, Abraham's joyful obedience as he did what God told him to do, and Sarah's joyful worship as well. So what can we learn from this? As we read this story, and certainly we rejoice with the words of it, but what can we learn from this? Well, let me just suggest three things. First of all, we can learn that God is, keeps his promises. Now, 
we probably all would, would acknowledge that and say that since God is sovereign God, he will keep his promises. But we need to be reminded of that. 2 Peter 3, 9 says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, like some men count slackness. And as you read the Bible, you discover that there are very many promises that are given by God. And it's important to kind of keep the promises straight. You see, some of the promises are personal promises, God that promises that God makes to individuals. Like in Genesis 15, where he made the covenant promise to Abraham as the father of the nation. Or in Acts chapter 18, when, when God made some promises to Paul as he was uh, at Corinth and he was fearful and God promised him, don't be afraid, but speak. I am with you. No one will attack you to hurt you. He promised Paul. That was a personal promise. So some promises are personal in the Bible. Some promises in the Bible are universal. In other words, they are for whoever. In fact, the word whoever or anyone is found there, like Romans 10, 13, that says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a universal promise. Or John 3, 16, whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a universal promise. And then some promises are conditional. In other words, God calls upon us to do something and then that promise will be ours. Like 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. Or James 4, verse 10, humble yourselves under the, the mighty hand of God and he will lift you up. You see, there's a condition there. But the bottom line is that God keeps his promises. The second lesson that we can learn from these verses today is that God expects obedience. God expects obedience. That's consistent with his character and a consistent theme in the word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, uh, verses 26 through 28, God reminded his uh, children, the children of Israel, that there would be blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. And he called upon them to be obedient to his law, obedient to his commands. In 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, we are told, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And then the words that God spoke to Joshua in Joshua 1 verse 8. He said, This book of the law, God's word, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. God expects obedience, and he promises his blessing upon us when we obey. So God keeps his promises, God expects obedience, and thirdly, there is joy in the will of God. There is joy in the will of God. Sometimes people talk about the will of God and that kind of scares them. Well, how do I know what God's will is? Well, let me just share with you that God's will is not something mysterious. It's not something that's hard. In fact, it's, it's based upon the word of God. Many years ago, I was introduced to a little booklet called Found God's Will by John MacArthur. And in that book, he points our thinking to the fact that God's word has some things that he says are the will of God. In other words, it says clearly several times in God's word, this is the will of God. For instance, 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, it's God's will that people be saved, that people turn to him. Do you want joy in your life? Do you want joy following the will of God? Then it all begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to this earth. He lived a perfect life. He died a sacrificial death, and then he rose victorious over the grave as we celebrated last Sunday so that we might have life. And the Bible says if we will but believe this, we will turn away from our sin and turn to Jesus in faith. The Bible promises that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
and it's God's will. He wants people to be saved. There's another prom or another statement in Ephesians 5 that says that it's God's will that be we we be filled with the Spirit. He says, don't be unwise, understand what the will of God is. And then he says to be filled with the Spirit, to be obedient to the Spirit. And the Spirit leads us through the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 tells us that it's God's will that we be sanctified or that we be pure and holy. You see, the Bible is full of statements like that that tell us this is the will of God. And so rather than um, worrying about, you know, where, what I should do and all these different specifics of the will of God, we should first of all be uh, trying to obey what God's word says. That is the will of God, to be obedient to God's word. Delight yourself in the Lord, Psalm 37, 4 says, and he will give you the desire of your heart. You see, when we delight ourselves in the Lord, when we're following his word, then the desire of our heart will be God's desire and we can walk in obedience to that. And the result is joy, because there's joy in following the will of God. Abraham and Sarah learned that God keeps his promises. All these years he'd been promising this son, and God kept his promise. Abraham and Sarah learned that God expects obedience, and they learned the hard way sometimes because they tried to do things their own way and they disobeyed. But then they learned that there's joy in the will of God. You see, these seven verses in Genesis 21 are, are verses of joy as they obeyed, as they realized God's promise. And so the question is, how about you? Have you learned these truths that God keeps his promises, that God expects obedience, and that there's joy in the will of God? It all begins with the relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you've never placed your faith and trust in him, I invite you to put your faith in him today. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful to you for uh, this short passage of scripture that we've looked at together today. We thank you for the fact that it reminds us that you are a God who always keeps his promises. Therefore, when you say, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, that's a promise that we can trust. And so I pray that if there's somebody listening today who has never in faith turned from their sin and called upon the name of the Lord, that even in this quiet moment, they would call upon you and trust you and believe in you for salvation today. And Lord, help us to strive to be people who obey your word, who follow your will as we find it in the word of God. And as we do, Lord, you promise that we will experience the joy of the Lord. Thank you so much for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I do thank you for joining me today, and I trust that these uh, thoughts from Genesis chapter 21 will be an encouragement to you as you're reminded of God's faithfulness and Abraham's joyful obedience and Sarah's joyful worship, that that will be motivation to you uh, to seek the will of God and to be obedient to him always remembering that God keeps his promises. I hope you'll join me again next next week in the Word of God. If you're able to, we invite you to join us right here at church as we worship the Lord together at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings at Faith Baptist Church. Thank you again. Goodbye.